Good morning. I'm Tara Sunshine, Executive Vice President here at the United States Institute of Peace, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the very first 2011 program of our, our new year. As many of you know, USIP has been deeply involved in Iraq for many, many years, going back to 2004. And to this day, we retain an office in Baghdad, and we are very proud of the work that our folks in Baghdad do and our staff here under the direction of Sean Kane and Manal Omar, Bill Taylor, Abby Williams, and many of the others who support what we do on the ground and in the field. We remain deeply committed to helping Iraq stabilize its country, to become what it wants to be, a secure and peaceful country, active in the world, active with its neighbors. And we know that this is an important moment in its evolution with the formation of a new government. And so we are anxious to hear from our guest today how this moment uh, will work, what challenges Prime Minister Maliki and his new cabinet will face. I'm going to introduce our guests. They will come up and make some very brief um, remarks from the podium and then join in a discussion moderated by Manal. And so with that, uh, we have uh, next to me Kubad Talabani, the representative of the Kurdistan Regional Government to the United States. He was previously the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan's liaison to the CPA and a negotiator in drafting Iraq's 2004 transitional administrative law. And seated second is our own Sean Kane. Third, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Wissam al Ubaidi, the representative of the U.S of the Al-Wafiq Al-Watani Party, and he is also the personal representative of Dr. Alawi in the United States, and he's allowed me to call him Dr. Sam, which is a lot easier than the longer name. And of course, we have at the end of the table Manal Omar. In addition to all the work that Manal does here, she is the author of Barefoot in Baghdad, a great read that I recommend you put on your 2011 reading list. And then, last but not least, we have with us Dr. Ali al-Dabah, who has been the spokesperson for the Iraqi government since 2006. So he has seen it all. He was earlier on the drafting committee for the new Constitution on Foreign Relations Committees. He is an expert on the Shiite clerical establishment and an expert in the field of human rights. Would you join me in welcoming this esteemed panel? And I will turn things over now to Manal. Thank you all for being here. I wanted to give just a brief set up because uh, I think that we're very eager to hear from the esteemed panel and I'd like to turn it over to them as soon as possible. I wanted to say that I'm very happy that USIP's first public event in 2011 is focusing on Iraq. With the competing priorities and the budget constraints that are dominating the conversations in the city, it's easy that what's happening in Iraq could be put aside or marginalized. We want to make sure that does not happen because the real challenge for a successful Iraq is only just beginning. The past seven years have been focusing on trying to establish a sense of stability and sovereignty in the country. And key issues that impact the lives of Iraqis' daily lives have been pushed back to the back burner. These, these issues can only be addressed by the Iraqi government, the primary duty bearer. Over the last nine months, the world have watched what many have called painstaking negotiations which took place to form the new government. This highlighted a positive aspect of a successful election and true democracy at work, but it also raised to the surface the concern of the government's ability to address the pressing needs of Iraq in a quick manner. Today, our panel celebrates a formation of a new government 
that, diff that represents different coalitions across the different political parties throughout Iraq. I've heard from several Iraqi friends in government that the government was definitely worth the wait, as a true power-sharing representation has emerged. Naturally, there are still many challenges. The most obvious, and I'd be remiss of not pointing out, is that a significantly large pop of the, part of the population, and I'm speaking specifically about women, are yet to be represented. At the same time, due to the delay in government formation, key issues that impact Iraq's future are, can no longer be deferred. There's a strong sense of urgency on the ground to feel the presence of the Iraqi government. The new government has a full plate of issues that include the future of the U.S.-Iraqi strategic partnerships, key political matters such as national reconciliation and addressing Arab-Kurdish tensions, and improving upon the previous government's record on service delivery and tackling corruption. Our esteemed panelists today will begin to address this crucial issue, and we hope to open the floor to a larger discussion through your questions. I'm very pleased to turn over the mic to Dr. Ali Dabbagh, who is the official representative. He's been re-elected in the new government for the Iraqi government, who will open with some remarks. Dr. Ali? Yes. Thank you, Manal. Uh, it's been gentlemen, good evening. Uh, my friends, thank you very much for everybody. Uh, I would like to brief for five minutes the situation here in Baghdad. Finally, we have our government, Iraqi government, on December 21st. The, the uh, national partnership government, which is uh, an inclusive and representative government of all components, uh, and all the political blocs have participated. This will make a positive sign that everybody had the same responsibility on making the success in Iraq, which will definitely put a huge burden on everybody that no more violence. There is a way to practice the politics. There is a way and there is a channel which you could express all what you want to do in Iraq through the election and you could win and you could join the government and this is really it's a message for all the violence group that no more violence accepted in iraq because everybody who participates in the political process he got the share to uh, uh, rule iraq to be part of the formula of the decision making uh, i know it is not a rosy picture for the future there are huge challenges many things to be fixed, and the government needs to address many difficulties which have been inherited during the past nine months, as well as the seven or eight years after the fall of the regime. We do need to improve the, on, the, on the domestic issues, the services which the people of Iraq are expecting from this government as they did their share and their responsibility. They had voted for four times, so they are expecting from this government to uh, give them the proper services which they need. Uh, they are expecting that the anti-corruption uh, uh, measure should be more and more uh, 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 improved in order to fight the huge corruption which we are facing, uh, as well as the domestic issue, which is the disputed areas, uh, uh, needs to be addressed. Kirkuk issue needs also to have uh, a wise a formula which could, uh, uh, which could satisfy all the components of Kirkuk without having any difficulties and problems and not to need to ignite any problem, whether it's a sectarian or ethnic problem. We do understand that the wisdom which we had during the past years for the, uh, uh, for the Kirkuk issue it will continue from all sides, from the region, from Kurdistan region, as well as from political leaders in Baghdad. Regarding the political issue, uh, we have to set up the regional relation with the uh, neighbor countries. As you, every, as everybody aware, uh, the last election, uh, we had experienced a huge interference from everywhere, everyone in the region, in the, in the internal uh, affairs of Iraq. Uh, 
before the election as well as the post election uh, and this needs to be addressed well needs to have a good relation with the neighbors based on the economical interest uh, mutual interest of the, uh, the, 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 the the neighbors uh, uh, this is this needs to uh, empower the political situation in Iraq the political relation in Iraq in order to uh, 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 not to allow any more uh, interference from the neighbor and also will not entitle any component or any political bloc to think that he could use or exploit the neighbor against the other political bloc here in Iraq. The uh, relation with Kuwait, which is one of the major and more, most important issue which the, the, the present government, the new government needs to be to address, uh, the most inherited problems with with the uh, with the with Kuwait as well as the border issues with Iran and the uh, presence of some of the terrorist organization like PKK like PJAK like uh, the other terrorist organization which needs to be also solved and fixed in a good way uh, and within the framework of the international laws uh, uh, the human rights record for the country needs to be improved, need to uh, educate the all levels of the government that the having a good governance, we do need to uh, uh, we do need to not to, to have a good uh, record of the human rights. Uh, the security issue, which is definitely needs to be addressed in a good way as to empower the security situation to protect the Christians from the horrific attack which they had uh, uh, which they had faced in the few months back. This is all uh, the challenges need to be addressed with the government. I guess, I think that the, with the national partnership government, which the shared responsibility of all the political uh, blocs, uh, makes a good atmosphere to start addressing these problems in a good will and in a good way. And also the uh, the regions, the the regional countries, the Arab countries, they need from their side also to look to, to a new Iraq in different way. As it, there is an inclusive government, uh, uh, Sunni and the Shia and the Kurds, they are major components, as well as the other ethnic minorities. They are uh, uh, inclusive in this government, so there is no uh, there is no uh, 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 there is no uh, difficulties, there is no problem for the other components that they are not inclusive in the government. So there is no excuses. There is no reason not to have a good relation with Iraq. So we are expecting that the Arab summit on March is to give a good message to the Iraqis as the Arab neighbor countries are supportive for the new government, the new elected government. This is what we are expecting from our side. We are doing our utmost in order to have a good relation. We had many, uh, uh, many uh, uh, senior officials from the neighbor country that had visited, visited Iraq and will continue visiting. On Saturday, the Amr Musa, the Arab League uh, General Secretary, will be here, as well as the, the uh, Prime Minister of Syria, the Turkish Foreign Minister will be, uh, the uh, Iranian uh, Foreign Minister was here in Baghdad today. So we had a good messages from the neighbor. We hope that the next relation and the uh, relation of Iraq will be based on the mutual interest uh, with no interference in this, in this country. Uh, we had faced a difficult situation which entitled some of the, some of the countries or ma majority of the countries to interfere with our pol uh, political affairs and internal affairs. Now Iraq is, uh, 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 Iraq is having a, 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 an inclusive government which uh, makes uh, the situation, the political situation, much more better. We are uh, uh, we are welcoming all the efforts to have a good relation with our neighbor. We don't want to be a stable country. We don't want to export any instability. We want to play a major role in the uh, in the worldwide economy and the in the power supply and the energy supply for the region as well as for the world and to be an a stability point here in this region in the Middle East. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Ali, uh, Dr. Hassan. Uh, Happy New Year, everybody, and thank you very much for your coming here. And really, it will be my pleasure to be here with you for the first time uh, in this perfect place. And thank you for all who arranged for this meeting, special to Mrs. Manal and Mr. Wahid, who is one of our guests here. He represents Washington branch for Al Wufaq al Watani al Iraqi. And to all our colleagues here. Uh, I will start my talking about Iraq in very simple statement, especially with my great, great, uh, I'm so happy, I'm, I feel very grateful to the announcement of a new Iraq government, especially in the last few days. This is 100% is will lead Iraq to a new future. And we have a hope toward the future that everything will go fine. I know there is a lot of negative things, positive things, but we have a hope in the announcement of a new government, shoulder on shoulder, to rebuild Iraq and we go back to the normal state of normal life for a great Iraqi government. This is number one. Number two, I hear a lot about uh, gratefulness from Arabic leaders and from government of United States government who protect Iraq and help us in a lot of things to rebuild Iraq, especially in the last few uh, months, in the, especially in the announcement of the new government. And it will be my pleasure to read one statement for Mrs. Excellency Mrs. Hillary Clinton when she say that Iraq is a great nation with a promising future. And really, this is a perfect statement and we hope everything will go fine from that time. And uh, also, I would like to tell you something about this country. Iraq will stay one country, united strongly. United strongly, and we will never accept any division to any part of Iraq. Iraq from Zahot al Faw is one country. When they ask me about your idea, I never tell them I'm Sunni or Shia or Kurdish or Christian or Sabi, I never say that. When they ask me, Dr. Sam, what is your ID? Do you know what I say? It is Iraqi bread and date of al-Basra and Yagat of al This is my ID. This is which collect me here in my Iraqi personality and nationality. About uh, Iraq, as you know, is a great nation. It starts from Babel which uh, teach the people the law for first time in the world. The first law written and is found in the Museum of France when I saw the, when I go there one day and I see it by my eyes, I shocked when I found the first law in the world is found in Baghdad, in Babel. This is something amazing. When you found the first government sign is, is written in Babel and about the economy of Iraq is a long list. First of all, of oil, and I will tell you something. The first British company in oil, when, she, when they do the first research in Al Basra about the oil before 100 years ago, they write a statement, they say, the last two gallon of oil in all the world, the last two gallon of oil in all of the world, one of them will be Iraqi. So from this statement, you can know what does Iraq mean, economy, and especially in oil field, is a big issue for Iraqi people. And we, as I do our connections with my party, we insist on important items, the education, the infrastructure, the economic state of the country, and the security. The security playing a big role and I have complete hope, 100%, everything will go fine with the new government and shoulder on shoulder with all our politics and all our leaders in Iraq, in Al-Iraqi and state of law and Kurdish, uh, which I'm so bright, proud to meet my friend here, Mr. Abad. And we hope everything will go fine. I don't want to talk too much and thank you for your coming and have a great day and happy new year for everybody. Mr. Kubad. Thank you. Uh, happy New Year to, to everyone. Um, 
thank you uh, to the USIP, not just for hosting this event, not just for making um, its first event of 2011 about Iraq, but for the great work that, that USIP has done since 2004, the bravery shown by USIP staff um, working in Iraq, working with people on the ground, whether it's through their rule of law program or their governance programs. Um, we hope that this will continue. We hope that you'll continue to be a champion to keep the United States interested in Iraq, to keep the United States engaged in Iraq, and we will certainly do our part to continue working with you to make sure that that relationship continues to strive. I do want to point out that um, much is said about um, Arab-Kurd tension or Arab-Kurd conflict. Um, I, I want us to try to move beyond these statements because there isn't Arab-Kurd tension in Iraq. There isn't any conflict between Arabs and Kurds in, in Iraq. Um, we have differences of opinions. We have differences between the regional government of Kurdistan and the federal government. We have differences between um, provinces within Iraq or within a region or a province. But um, we haven't come close to conflict. Um, and the tension that I is labeled it has never really gone down to a street level where people on the streets have been tense with, with one another. Um, and I'm hopeful that, that uh, as, as we start to define Iraq, as we continue to analyze what's going on in Iraq, that we can, we can be more nuanced when we talk about um, the, these issues. We, we're all happy that there is a government, um, uh, you know, better late than never, um, but better never late, as <laughs> my wife always reminds me. Um, but, you know, the, the, the easy part is done. We have a government. Uh, the government is, you know, we still have some key ministries that are outstanding. Um, but the hard part, as, as the title of this event actually states, really now begins, and, and that is governance. Um, how can this government in Iraq start to develop and implement policies, uh, move beyond politics, which is what we've been embroiled in for the last 10 months, or you, know, you could say the last uh, seven years, uh, and start to actually develop policies, start to actually execute and implement policies. Um, so that, that is what I think the biggest challenge that faces I Iraq today, working out the mechanics of, of governance. You know, we have a government now. How does this government actually make decisions? How, is the parli what is, what, how will the parliament play its role to be an effective check on the government? We've heard all about the concerns. Some of them are ours as well, about power sharing, about making sure that there isn't too much power concentrated in the hands of one person or one ministry or one institution. How do we actually effectively um, implement these power sharing ag arrangements and agreements? Um, I think uh, we've got key policy issues that are still undefined. Um, uh, you know, we, we don't have a, uh, an oil policy. We don't have a, an energy policy. We don't have an agriculture policy. We haven't had a, a broad security policy. Now this government has to define these policies, and, and it has to come, obviously, from the top, but it has to only be, it has to be executed and implemented through partnering with the different institutions of, of the government. We, we hear about the checks and balances, the power sharing um, arrangements that are being put together, um, the different councils that are being established and the powers being given to those councils, but really the most effective check on the government is going to be the government itself. Um, and if the government um, acts as a council, as the cabinet makes its decisions as it's supposed to, as a council, as the council of ministers, where everyone is by and large represented in that council, all the major political forces are represented on that council. So you should have a cross sector of, of political views represented in that cabinet. If that cabinet uh, wants to be a check on the powers of the prime minister or, or another minister, then they should be able, they should be brave enough to speak up and not agree to everything that is presented to them. We have to move beyond the, the, the traditional yes boss mentality that has riddled Iraq through its history. And people should speak up and say, you know, I'm a member of this cabinet, I don't agree with this policy, and, and make their voices heard. And I think if the Council of Ministers actually does that, if it behaves that way, that can be the most effective check on on any one person um, taking too much power uh, into, into their own hands. Um, needless to say that there are outstanding issues resolved, uh, that, that need to be resolved by this government, issues that r involve 
disputes between the Kurdistan regional government and the federal government. There are other issues that, uh, that have nothing to do with Kurdistan that, again, need to be addressed. I'm confident in, in the, the statements coming out even this early on from, from the new government on issues such as oil, on issues on the need. And we heard um, the spokesman, uh, Dr. Ali Dabag, talk about the need to address issues such as Kirkuk and the disputed territories. The fact that we're, we're talking about these issues this early on is a positive sign. Um, we're, we're excited, we're encouraged, and we look forward to working with our partners in the government to, to address these issues once and for all. Because we've all heard about the potential of Iraq. Dr. Sam highlighted Iraq's history. Um, uh, Dr. Ali talked about Iraq's potential. Uh, and it would be a real travesty if Iraq fails to reach that potential. Um, and it can only reach that potential if it starts to actually function as a government, if it starts to actually start to develop vision uh, as a country. Um, as diverse as the country is, its strength can really lie in its diversity. Um, other key topics that will come up, I think, very soon um, will be how to activate and, and implement the strategic framework agreement between Iraq and the United States and also whether or not there'll be a renegotiation to the status of forces agreement. Uh, lawyers on both sides are also looking at the possibilities of, well, does the strategic framework agreement cover security issues? Does there need to be a renegotiation of the SOFA or could, could any security relationship between the United States and Iraq live under the existing strategic framework agreement, which has no real timeline or, or end date. So that these are things for clever lawyers to figure out, and, and, and we'll, we'll see whether that could be a, a, an easy way to ensure that there is a long-lasting and strong multi-sector relationship, multi-faceted relationship between Iraq and the United States. Um, Kurds of Iraq have never been shy about wanting a long-term relationship with the United States. We think that it's essential for Iraq's continued development that there be a strong political, economic, and security relationship with the United States, not just because of your role in liberating Iraq, but because of the potential that we could gain from a strong and, and multifaceted relationship with, with Iraq. So these are, these are key issues that I'm sure we'll debate and discuss as the months go on. Um, I'm happy to report that Kurdistan continues to be a shining example. It continues to develop. It continues to remain stable. And it continues to play an important and positive role in the rest of the country. We saw that during the government formation process. I can assure you that we'll continue to see that as Iraq starts to develop these key policies that are so needed to ensure that Iraq reaches its potential. And I want to thank you all again for attending. Thanks for having me here. And I look forward to an interesting and healthy discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Kabad. Sean? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Manal, and thank you, everyone, uh, for <coughs> making the effort to come in here today. Uh, I'm delighted to be on the panel uh, with the real experts on the si situation in Iraq and Iraqi politics. And as an outsider, I've been asked to try to stir up the pot a little bit uh, to lead us into discussion and to, uh, to try to provide a bit of an outside perspective on things to look for in terms of early steps that might give us an indication of where we're going. Uh, I visited both Kirkuk and Baghdad late last year, and I was surprised, particularly in Baghdad, as compared to over the summer, uh, the mood uh, was quite positive. There was a, a real sense of a need to get on with things, form the government, start governing. And someone remarked to me yesterday, you shouldn't be surprised by that. The title of the government should be the government uh, of keeping everyone happy, because it has tried to bring almost every uh, individual party uh, together and underneath the tent. Uh, and what I wanted to try to do uh, briefly here today is just highlight three issues which I think might give an early indicator as to whether this positive mood and tone can translate into substance. And the first uh, issue I wanted to flag was the National Council for Strategic Policies to be headed by Yad Alawi. And not necessarily because of the direct role this council may or, not, may or may not play, but because it appears the tenor of those discussions between Dr. Alawi and Prime Minister Mali, Maliki are really setting the overall tone in Baghdad and have a positive spillover effect in other areas, such as who will fill the all-important security ministries, which are still vacant, how uh, progress might be made on the issue of justice and accountability, uh, integration of the SAFWA. But the tenor of that conversation seems to spill over and affect the wider process. And so I think it's important to keep an eye on that uh, from that reason, or for that reason. And just as an interesting aside, it's. Uh, uh, very interesting to me that former Prime Minister Ibrahim al Jafari is playing a role in facilitating the discussions between those two men. He's, of course, part of the exclusive three-person club of 
uh, post-2003 prime ministers in Iraq, and he apparently has the ability to say both to Alawi and to Maliki, hey, you're being unreasonable on this point, why don't you give a little bit here, why don't you give a little bit there? And you'll see a lot of the press statements made by m both men after their meetings sort of complimenting him on the role, and uh, that's just sort of an interesting side note for me. Uh, the second issue I wanted to flag, uh, we've heard a lot about national rec reconciliation, and I wanted to hone in on one particular aspect of it, and it's really, I think, what I would term uh, uh, the terms of participation in public life, uh, whether that's politics, whether that's government, whether that's the security forces. Iraq has very much, after 2003, moved towards a representative form of government and politics and an inclusive form of government, but it hasn't unambiguously clarified who can participate in public life and under what terms. And we've seen with the debathification process procedures which I think uh, at best can be described as ad hoc, uh, cause political disruption, and when we keep in mind that the largest employers in the country remain the civil service and the security forces are also real economic disruption for a lot of people. One of the key aspects of the power sharing agreement reached in November was to uh, finally form the Justice and Accountability Board. This was after the law was passed in 2008, supposed to replace the Debathification Commission, but Parliament couldn't agree on who would be the board members. So as a result, the old commission and a committee in Parliament uh, ran a lot of the debathification procedures and the elections in a process that wasn't fully grounded in law. And so I think this is an early test for national reconciliation, whether uh, this Justice and Accountability is form Board is formed and that process is thereby more firmly grounded in law. We've seen an early symbolic step in the lifting of the debathification bans on people like Salah Mutlak so he can be the Deputy Prime Minister. But as an indicator of how difficult this might be, I think 61 deputies voted against this move and a number of members of the National Alliance uh, didn't attend the session as a form of protest. So this is an issue I think that is worth keeping an eye on, whether this uh, board is formed and as is the case in uh, post-conflict vetting procedures around the world and as is called for in the power sharing agreement in November, whether a two-year deadline is set for its work so this process is completed and Iraq can move on. Uh, the third issue I wanted to highlight, uh, and in deference to our previous speaker, I'll say outstanding issues between uh, Baghdad and Erbil and try to avoid the word tensions. Uh, these are well known, uh, and there are a set of you know, very important substantive issues, whether it relates to federalism, oil, the future of Kirkuk, and other uh, disputed territories. And I think one of the most notable uh, uh, facets of this last election process was the success which Iraqia had in consolidating what was previously a very uh, fragmented Arab and Turkmen polity in the north of Iraq, in uh, Nineveh, in Kirkuk, and in Diyala. It's very hard to have a negotiation on these issues if you don't know who the representatives of a major part of the population is there. There isn't a return address, and there now is potentially a return address there. Uh, this was something which, during the government formation negotiations, Iraqia really stressed uh, to the Kurdish parties that uh, we should have a prominent role in government if you want to be able to see progress on these issues. Uh, we can now represent these people and deliver them uh, in political discussions and any potential agreement. And since the election, we have, I think, seen a bit of a rapprochement, particularly, and that's particularly apparent with uh, the Najafi brothers, Osama Najafi, the speaker, and Afil Najafi, the governor of Mosul, and the KDP uh, in particular, but the KRG as a whole. Uh, Speaker Osama Najafi participated in the KDP party conference in Erbil, and Athil Najafi has been traveling to Erbil for quiet discussions on power sharing in Nineveh. And that's what I want to highlight is this first test in this area. Uh, there have been a set of negotiations facilitated by uh, uh, the person who's now the finance minister, Ray Fasawi, on power sharing in Nineveh, having the Kurds return to the provincial council, uh, issues related to property detainees. Uh, and that agreement was pretty much set pending the formation of government. Does that agreement get done on local power sharing in Nineveh? Because if it does, I certainly heard while I was in Kirkuk that that has positive spillover effects for local power sharing in Kirkuk, but also for a broader sense that it is possible to make progress on a set of issues which uh, have this perception of being intractable. And again, with respect to our previous speaker, there were certainly local tensions in Kirkuk, particularly around the census and reports uh, of 
Arab and Turkmen being threatened to leave the province and Kurdish people being uh, threatened and forced to leave their homes. We've seen that a little bit in Northeast Diyala. We've seen that in the Nunavut Plains. So there is uh, some tension on the ground, but in a positive sense, there's also rapprochement at the national level. And I think that power sharing deal in Nunavut, if that gets done, gives us an idea as to whether uh, there will be some substance, substantive move uh, on these issues in the next term. Uh, finally, just because I've been asked to uh, provide a little bit of the U.S. perspective, uh, I wanted to talk about the issues related uh, to the strategic partnership between the U.S. Uh, and Iraq. And there's been, I think, a long wait and an eagerness to discuss with the new government from the U.S. side both the strategic framework agreement and the nature of security cooperation after 2011. And I had some discussions about this uh, with a range of Iraqi officials when I was in Baghdad. And as one sort of senior official who I think would be a principal in a discussion said, the vision for this right now is blurred. Uh, it's something the new government's going to have to discuss, but it's hard to predict, particularly on the security side, what things will look like. Uh, there was certainly a lot of attention given uh, to the interview Prime Minister Maliki had with the Wall Street Journal, uh, where, I quote, he said that the agreement is not subject to extension, alt not subject to alteration. It is sealed and it expires on December 31st, 2011. He did, however, and this wasn't always reported, leave himself an opening where he said, except if the new government with Parliament's approval wanted to reach a new agreement with America or another country, that's another matter. Uh, certainly earlier in the year, Prime Minister Maliki talked about, uh, and again I'm quoting from an interview with the Washington Post, uh, where he said, my opinion is what determines the number of advisors or fighters is the nature of the situation in Iraq. Will Iraq after 2011 need foreign forces on a combat level or in confronting terrorism or in need of training? The basis will then be decided but after approval by parliament. And obviously as political circumstances change and the nature of the government and the coalition change, uh, the views of different people and what is politically acceptable will evolve. Uh, but I think it's important to keep in mind that this is something which is going to be discussed and the outcome isn't clear right now. Uh, we know, I think, quite well what the view of the Sadrus is. Uh, as Mr. Talibani said, we have a fairly good idea of what the Kurdish position is. And I think the real determining factor here will be what a lot of people who are saying in private, you know, we might need some help with uh, defending our borders, the airspace. Uh, we might need some sort of symbolic presence to show to the region that Iraq is not a playground for everyone to come into, uh, what they're willing to say in public, and how that plays out discussions on the Iraqi side. Uh, from a U.S. perspective, I think uh, an important message is not to wait too long. The last uh, security agreement uh, was negotiated uh, in November 2008, a month before the, exp the expiration of the Chapter 7 mandate. Uh, for multinational forces in Iraq. Right now, and I, and I sort of want to stress this, the U.S. military is sort of like a machine. And once that switch is turned to put the drawdown from 50,000 to zero into effect, it's very hard to arrest it or turn it backwards. And so waiting until November to start a discussion, I, I think, would be problematic. Uh, the second issue I wanted to flag is, again, the strategic framework agreement. Uh, going back to Maliki, during the, the interview, the Wall Street Journal reporter mentioned that Ambassador Jeffrey carries a copy of the Strategic Framework Agreement in his briefcase. And Maliki chuckled to this and said, this is good work and evidence of commitment. We actually asked for this. It is a scientific, commercial, economic expertise and training agreement. We're insisting that it be activated because it's in Iraq's interest. America is a, a superpower with expertise and huge capabilities in science, trade, and economy, and the country needs such expertise. I think it's in the interest of both countries that as much as possible the discussion about security uh, cooperation be linked to the conditions on what is needed in Iraq for stability. And it will be impossible to fully separate politics from it, but this is the ideal. And the extent to which uh, there's progress on implementing the strategic framework agreement, so it's shown that the relationship isn't about uh, the formerly occupied and the former occupier but rather a whole range and a host of technical issues which are of value to Iraq, it can at least take hopefully some of the politics out of it and be about what condition, what is most uh, appropriate, I guess, for promoting stability and uh, the long run tra trajectory of Iraq. So I think I'll leave it with that and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Sean. That was very helpful. Um, and to all our speakers for highlighting these important points. Um, what I'd like to do as moderator is actually take the right of first question. 
And um, I mentioned earlier in the introduction, but I wanted to highlight, as uh, Sean was mentioning, everyone was happy. There was a sacrifice that was made during the negotiations, which were women, which were more than 50% of the population. And beyond the fact of women's issues, it tends to be an indicator of how government is in touch with the grassroots and with civil society. So my question would be, what are the um, specific actions that are be t being taken by your political parties to try and address this issue, particularly because there are still seats that are not yet appointed in government. Um, the other question that I would ask is we just found out this morning that Muqtada Sadr has returned to Iraq. Um, this is after, as we know, a four-year um, self-imposed exile. How do you think that will impact the unity government, if at all? Thank you, Mrs. Minal. Actually, about uh, uh, Mr. Muqtada Sadr and a lot of Iraqi uh, leaderships, uh, it will be my pleasure to put our hand together. Everybody, all Iraqi uh, politics, parliaments, because Iraq is not only for uh, one leadership. We believe in uh, unity together. We must do unity together to rebuild Iraq. One hand can't do the job without the agreements of all the people, all the political people from the north to the south. So we insist on the unity of the Iraq and the leaderships. What let me happy when I saw on the TV that all the Iraqi leadership stop one stand in front of Iraqi flag on the day of announcement of the new government. And this is the promising future for all Iraqi. Thank you, Ms. Mena. And women, Dr. Wissam, is there? About the women's, uh, sure, in our uh, Iraqi new government, there is an item, insists that the women have a big role, not for this day, no, for all the future, because the women is half the society, is have a big role. A lot of women with me, doctors, engineers, leaders, uh, she assists Iraqi in everything, she uh, play a big role in helping Iraq people and teaching our kids in, in uh, culture and education. So it's must to have a great role, especially in ministers and leadership, and we insist on this. Dr. Tabani. Sure, and uh, I think I can second um, Dr. Sam's points. Um, obviously, uh, there's a lot of disappointment the fact that there were no women in the initial cabinet. Uh, there are some posts that are still outstanding. Um, I know uh, we in the Kurdistan region have always had a good record of, of having women in government. We're going to continue to push to ensure that um, that we do get some women in the, the government of Iraq, but not just because they're women. Uh, I think this is uh, this always gets me into trouble when I say this because I have to be very careful how I say this. Um, we, we want women in the cabinet because they're competent, not just because they're women. I, th I think it does women a disservice when you just put a woman in a position for the fact that she's she's a woman. If she's not competent, then that, that really does backfire. And I think the important thing is to ensure, and there are many in Iraq, um, by the way, competent women, um, we, we need to ensure that there is a woman in the government, but also a competent woman in the government. And I'm confident that, that we can get around this and, and, and make it happen. As far as uh, Sayyid Muqtada Sadr's return to Iraq, I, I think it's always good that people that are interested in Iraq, people that are working on Iraq, people that are leaders within Iraq be in Iraq and work from Iraq and uh, I think it's a positive sign that he's returned to Iraq. He obviously uh, his movement did very well in the elections and are a factor of Iraqi political life now. Great, thank you. And we have microphones that are floating so we'll open up the floor to questions. <coughs> this question here. Or is the mic there right here? My name is Saeed Eric from the Kulta Daily Newspaper. My question to the panel, to Mr. Sean Kane, uh, on the Strategic Council. Could you explain to us what is the status of that council? How does it avoid conflicting with the different ministries or the cabinet posts and so on? Because it, as it seems, it's been assigned the same kind of function. Thank you. Um, you take more than I, I think we'll take three at a time. So next question. Hi, Ken Meyer, Court from World Docs. Uh, it's my understanding that an election held in a country occupied by foreign troops has no validity under international law. Could someone clarify that? Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Hi. 
I'm Mike Murphy, Cass Mina Gulf Consultants. Uh, my question is for Mr. Talamani, but any of the panelists can feel free to comment. I was wondering if you could comment on uh, efforts to reconcile. Uh, we mentioned outstanding issues, and we mentioned oil. Um, the production service contracts that the KRG had issued, um, is there a timeline for reconciling those with the centrally controlled Ministry of Oil? Uh, what provisions might change, uh, and when will blacklisting, quote unquote, officially end? Thank you. So we'll turn to the panel to answer the first three, and then we'll take the next set. Do you want to go for the first one? Sure. Uh, and I'll invite either of the panelists uh, to add on this on the question on the National Council on Strategic Policies. I mean, a big part of the debate has been whether it will have executive authorities or whether it be a purely advisory body. And I have to confess it's still not entirely clear to me. Uh, I know that there are reports that uh, Prime Minister Maliki and Dr. Alawi will be meeting this week to further uh, discuss this issue. Uh, and this is why, particularly in my remarks, I was focusing on less the direct role it might play, but the sort of overall tenor of those discussions and a satisfactory outcome and role for Dr. Alawi where he feels like he has an input into the policy making process of affecting other issues. But there is this question, and until we actually see a text of a draft law, as to how it will in interact with the ministries, how it relates to something like the Council of Ministers. Uh, we've heard the kind of benchmark of 80% as to whether or not uh, there would have to be consensus within the Council of 80% for it to take actions. But even that's not clear to me. I mean, that's just secondhand press reports. Uh, no, I, I think just we have to manage expectations here. That this government is is not going to be the prettiest government. It's not going to be the most effective government. Uh, I think we're, we're still at a stage where there is significant distrust within the various components of Iraqi society, within the various components of of the government. These councils are, are there to try to uh, balance the issues, to, to, to kind of lessen the mistrust, to make sure that there is a, a variety of different voices uh, involved in the government policy formation uh, process. I, I think um, there's been talk of ensuring that, that uh, things to do with oil or national security issues go through this council. This has been one of the things that, that's been floated around. Um, but, but at the same time, it can't replace the cabinet, but it can certainly play an Im important role to ensure that, that again, it's, it's another check on the cabinet. It's, it's another way to keep the country going in the right direction, but also to get the leaders of the country, the different leaders of the different components of the country, to really help formulate that vision that is so desperately required. Uh, thank you for the question about the oil. Really, it was so interesting. Uh, I think the new government, uh, the Iraqi, the all Iraqi leaders, you know the oil is the main, uh, the main power now for Iraq and for the economy, especially in a few next few months. And the Iraqi leaders for the new government, they will have a lot of meetings about that in the next few weeks. And they will decide what is the best for Iraqi and the strategy of the money and how it will be for the oil strategy studies and in the next few months. And we hope they will do the best to Iraqi people, all the leaders together when they will reach to the final decision about Iraqi oil. We sure that it will go to the uh, the best of Iraq, everything. And uh, about the role of the army in the elections, or the election happened during the army period or something like this, we all know that the election needs some security. And without security, we can't do a right election. So uh, I'm very grateful to all security people from Iraqi side and from American side protect the election centers in that day. It was uh, really a big a big disaster in that day when the Iraqi go to election because you know there's sectarian violence everywhere. And really I met a lot of people personally. They afraid to go there because from sectarian uh, violence. But they go there because they feel that they will do something for Iraq in the election day. Even I met some sick people on wheelchair, disabled, they insist to go there, even if there is a violent sector, because they want to do something, simple things. He told me the simple things I can do it to Iraq is to put my sound in the box to Iraq. And this is, I think, for me personally, thank you very much for all security people from Iraqi side, 
from Minister of Defense, Minister of Interior in that time, who protect the uh, election day, and even from the American side, even uh, they do a great job to protect a lot of centers in the north, in the south, in the middle of Iraq, and even in the west of Iraq, which have a great violence in that day. Thank you very much. I think just to c clarify this point, the, the U.S. forces were there as part of an agreement between yeah. Iraq and the United States. They were not there illegally. There was there uh, an, uh, an agreement between two sovereign countries. Um, so that hopefully addresses the gentleman's question. As far as the question on, on oil, I think this is one area of, of I think, optimism right now. Um, we have a new oil minister um, who is actually somebody from the industry. He is an oil man. Um, and the initial statements from the oil ministry have been very positive. Um, there's been discussions it's be during the government formation process between um, regional government officials and, uh, and people in the, the, the federal government and also in the leadership of the, the, the new Iraq's leadership. Um, the, the, the points we're trying to, to clarify right now, obviously we've had some good, good statements regarding exports from Kurdistan. We're ready to export 100,000 barrels a day. Um, that should start soon. Uh, the agreement is pretty much in place and it just needs to be uh, finalized. And I'm sure it'll be one of the first things that the new government of Iraq really works on. Um, I, I think that, again, it comes back to that potential. Uh, potential not just for Kurdistan, but also for the, for the whole country. There is a sound oil policy. If there's sound uh, investment in the oil sector, if there's good management of the oil sector, of the oil and gas sector, um, Iraq can truly fulfill its potential. I think that we're confident that what we have done in the north um, is completely in line with the federal constitution, but also our regional uh, hydrocarbons law. Uh, we do think that, that Iraq does need a national hydrocarbons law, um, but I think critical to that is the revenue sharing component. Nothing can build trust better, stronger, and quicker than an effective, transparent revenue sharing formula. Um, if the country starts to benefit from its oil proceeds, people will be happy, politicians will be happy because their constituents will be happy, and then you can start to genuinely build the trust that's so vitally needed. So I think these are, these are key issues. They're on the, the front burner. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that this will be one of the first things that the, the new government of Iraq really tries to tackle. Um, the atmosphere, the political climate is better. There isn't this um, kind of politically charged atmosphere that we've seen over the last few years. The statements are good. Now we just need to follow through on the statements to actually deliver on those statements, um, ratify a, 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 a national framework, uh, execute a, a revenue sharing law, and, and Let's just get to work and start developing the country's resources. Thank you. Next set of questions. Do we have the microphone up here for Ren? Thank you. Uh, Ren Del Rahim, I'm the executive director of the Iraq Foundation. Um, I'm actually going to sit down if you don't mind. Um, I have a question for the whole panel. Uh, and if you don't mind, it's two questions, but quick. One of them is that nobody really addressed the outstanding issue of the constitutional amendments, uh, which have been hanging out there since 2007. And um, I'm aware that uh, many political parties believe that these are extremely important. Others feel that, no, we really don't want to talk about them. What are the chances that the new parliament will address this issue in the coming year. And if it, do, if it does not, what are the consequences? And the second quick question is that there is a great deal of talk now, increasing talk, of regionalization of the province of Basra. There are also demands in Ambar for the Ambar province to become a region. And uh, there are even, there's even talk in areas like Maysan and so on, for different reasons. If these actually happen, if this regionalization happens, what will be the impact <coughs> on the national government? How will this com change the complexion of Iraq as a unitary or a unified functioning country. Thank you. Thank you, Rand. The question in the back. Oh, it's you. 
Thanks, Nick. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sterling Jensen from National Defense University. Uh, my question is for Sean. You know, there's still a lot of uh, in the Iraqi diaspora. You know, even a lot of people here would like to go back to Iraq, but they think national reconciliation. You know, they'll be, they'll be targeted by militias or um, for political issues rather than just personal security issues. Um, do you think the new government's going to be serious about national reconciliation? Um, I know the debathification issue is, 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 is a core issue, but you know, how serious do you think they're going to be? Um, can, can we go here? Perry, we'll get you next. Right here. I have the mic. Um, I, I know. Uh, Ellen Lapson from the Stinson Center. I also wanted to go further on the reconciliation issues. Uh, you talked about the transition from debathification to this new justice and accountability board, but some of the issues they tackled were rather elite, eligibility to run for office or to serve in public institutions. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about what's happening at the society level. Uh, it seemed to me that a lot of the work that was being done was being done because international NGOs were coming in and saying it should be done. But I wonder whether we see any shift, any spontaneous uh, activity happening at the kind of community level, at neighborhoods, et cetera. And I thought we needed to flag the uh, crisis of the Christian community in Iraq. Um, it's not unique to Iraq. We've been seeing violence against Christians in Pakistan and in Egypt. But I wondered, uh, the Iraqi case is such a unique one culturally and historically. And I wondered whether politicians in Baghdad are talking about this or whether they think it should be on the national agenda of how to prevent the complete exodus of the Christian community. Thanks. One more question from Perry, and then we'll go to the panel. Uh, Perry Karadagi, uh, Executive Director of Kurdish Human Rights Watch. Um, I have actually three sets of questions. Um, as usual, but, um, uh, one of them was in regards to women issues and civil society. We're very, very concerned in the international community, in the NGO community, in regards to the role of women and the marginalization of women in the Iraqi government, as well as um, the, the laws that are enacted to protect women. Uh, the other issue that I'm concerned about is the status of the IDP situation. As we know, there is a large Christian community that's coming to Kurdistan so far, we have registered uh, approximately 580 families that have come from Baghdad to the north. Now, we know that there are very little schools and roads and health services, and KRG has a problem as far as the budget is concerned because its allocated budget is for its own citizens, not, not for the IDP situation. The third item is the refugee situation. We know that there is a large Iraqi expat refugee community outside of Iraq in neighboring countries. You know, over two million. How do we deal with the IDP situation inside Iraq? What are the laws? And then how do we deal with the IDP and refugee situation if they were to return to Iraq? Right, thank you. And I'll turn it over to the panel. Um, Prabhat, do you want to start since the last questions were targeted towards you? Um, sure. Should I, should I address all, all three? Yes. Okay. Um, well, where to, where to begin? <laughs> um, uh, briefly on the constitutional amendments, uh, I think that you know there's a process, there's a format. I think we have to all understand the constitution is not a, uh, it's it's a living document. Constitutions change, constitutions get amended. Um, it's not easy to amend constitutions, and it shouldn't be easy to amend constitutions. Uh, it, it, but it, they can be amended, um, and that has to be requested. It has to go through a process, and it has to be championed. Uh, I think if. If anyone wants to change the Constitution, if they're just going to sit back and try to wait for somebody else to present this, somebody else to champion it, it'll never get done. If a bloc, if a group, if a, if a coalition within the parliament genuinely believes that this Constitution needs to be amended, they have to fight for it, and they have to go through the democratic process, they have to go through the parliamentary process uh, to make it happen. Um, uh, I think, and again, that comes back to the political will of those people interested or, or not. In terms of the, the regionalization, um, the, the request from Basra and Bar, Maysan, and others, again, I think this is something that is, uh, you know, as long as it falls within the Constitution, what the Constitution outlines in the federalism legislation, um, which, is, which is clear, um, I think it doesn't need to be seen as something that is working against the interest of a unified Iraq. Um, I think the Kurdistan example has been unique. 
Um, we are part of Iraq. We're playing a key role uh, in Iraq, but we also have a very high degree of autonomy um, in our own region. Uh, you know, it, it's in, in a sense, if, if other regions form in Iraq, whether it's Basra, whether it's Anbar, whether it's other areas, it can take the burden off the federal government. It can take a big load off the federal government. Um, it, it, it puts executive power in the hands of people who are mostly e interested in ensuring their regions develop, but also will probably have the means to ensure their regions develop. We've been very happy to see six, several delegations, whether it's from the Anbar Economic, Politi Economic Council, who have come to Kurdistan, who have looked at our models, who have looked at our legislative process, um, but even from, there's a very strong relationship now between the province of Basra and the province of Erbil. Um, there are all kinds of uh, chambers of commerce, trades, and, and delegations that are coming. And I think people are starting to realize that federalism is not a nasty word. <laughs> federalism is something that it does not mean the end of Iraq. It does not mean the, the separation of Iraq or the fragmentation of Iraq. It's a political system that could be applied to deal with countries as diverse as Iraq. This is not the partition states of America. This is the United States of America. And I think if we can just, and, and, and there is, I think, a much higher degree of sophistication in terms of understanding federalism now in Iraq. We still need to do more. There still needs to be much stronger public education on federalism. And I think what, what the State Department has done very effectively through its international visitors programs, bringing mid-level officials, bringing parliamentarians to the United States just to see the federal models here. Now, Iraq's federalism will not be a replica of America's federal model. I don't think there is a federal model in the world that could just be cut and pasted onto Iraq. But we can learn from other federations. It may not be a symmetrical federation. It may be an asymmetric federation where Kurdistan has certain powers. Anbar may not have the same kinds of powers as Kurdistan does. But again, as long as it's done through a constitution, through the constitutional process, through the, the laws that are already enacted and in place, the federalism law, uh, I think this is good for Iraq. This is good for governance in Iraq. It'll make it more effective. And what it will do, which I think will be most critical to Iraq's future, it, it will diminish the prize of Baghdad. We saw the, the tussle over mm -hmm. Baghdad during this government formation process. They tussled over it because Baghdad today is the prize. It's the center of power. It's where decisions get made. It's, it's where, more importantly, money gets dispersed. If we make Baghdad less of that prize, the prize is Erbil, Anbar, Maysan, Kirkuk, Hilla, then, you know, I, I think that, that we, can, we can lessen this rush, this, this power struggle for Baghdad, and I, I, I genuinely be, believe, and I may be a little biased in this, but I genuinely believe it will be a more effective process um, and system for the long term. The Christian issue is critical. Um, I, I think it's not just a local issue. It's a national issue. It must be treated at a national level. There's a security component to it um, in terms of who is securing these areas. But I, I think what isn't discussed is, look, and for much of the, where Iraqi Christians live today, not, not necessarily five years ago, but today, is in the disputed territories of Iraq. Um, and again, there are all kinds of ambiguities associated with who's to administer these areas, who's to protect these areas, who's to develop these areas. If we address the uh, disputed territories issue and remove these ambiguities, then we'll hold whoever's in charge of securing these areas accountable. Today, there's all kinds of finger pointing. When something happens in the Nineveh Plains, federal government says, well, this is not really, I'm not really in charge. The regional government says we're not really in charge because it falls within this gray area. We need to get rid of these gray areas. We need black and white areas. We need clear administrative boundaries, and that's why it's so important to address the, the, administ you know, the, the disputed territories issue. Um, we can't have Iraq's Christians leave the country. We can't lose a, an indigenous population. Um, and, and I have to urge U.S. Uh, uh, refugee organizations, predominantly out of Michigan, who are almost enticing them to come here. Uh, I understand the situation in Iraq is probably not ideal. But it would be a travesty for Iraq if this community were to leave the country, which is why Kurdistan has opened its doors to the Christian community. President Barzani has been on record time and time again to say there is a welcome home in Kurdistan. Um, Perry's organization has settled 500 families. There's been uh, several other thousand families that have come through uh, other, other organizations, and it's, it's their country, so they're, they're welcome to stay there. The big debate within the community itself is whether or not they should have an autonomous administrative region for themselves. Again, this is, I think, an issue for the Christian community of Iraq to address. 
for them to discuss, for them to make a decision on, and once they've made a decision, they have to go through, again, the legal, parliamentary, constitutional process. If they want to pursue it, they have the right to pursue it, um, but there are very disputed uh, ideas. The diaspora, as in most diasporas, are always more extreme um, and more opinionated than, than people are on um, the ground. And uh, I've spoke, probably spoken a little bit too long, so yeah, I'll... That have was great, though. Thank you. Dr. Wassam, do you, do you want to add? Uh, Sean? Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for the question about the refugee. Really, it is a big fire. It's a big fire. And the refugee, before I start to talking about the refugee, uh, thank you very much to all countries who accept Iraqi as a refugee and give them some help, a temporary help in this difficult situation. To all countries around Iraq, I don't want to give a names, but to all the governments who protect Iraqi refugee, really. <laughs> it's a wonderful job, especially in this difficult time. And about the refugee, what their fate or what will happen, I have a connections with thousands of refugees. All of them say one word. We will go back after everything go fine in Iraq. That's why this is a question mark to the new government, that we must to speed up formation, rebuild Iraq so the refugee can go back normally to, their, to start their normal life in their country. About the Christian, uh, Personally, I lost the best friend for me and the best helper. He's uh, died in the last explosion in the, in the terrorism attack about the church in Al-Qaeda. And this is was so sad. And it's a big file for Christian and Sabi at the same time because I met, uh, I have a good relation with the Sabi minister. He's uh, uh, now in Syria, I think. Uh, and this issue, it will be closed as fast as the security file will be closed for Iraq. The security file is not uh, dealing with the Christian only. Any home in Baghdad, any home in the south, in the north, in the west, in the east of Iraq, they suffer from violence, sector violence, terrorism attack, Qaeda members, and the security file is for all Iraqi people. And I think this is the priority of the new government. About the women rights, uh, Iraq is still from the beginning until now, insist on the women rights and have complete share with the man in everything. And about regionalization, uh, when you open our website, our party website, al wifaq al al iraqi the first two words in this website, Iraq is one country strongly united. But about federalization, like Mr. Talbani, I will leave this to our leaders. If they found this, will give something strong to the new Iraq. That's what our leaders in the next few weeks will decide it. And I'll, I personally, I hope all the best to Iraq. If federalization will lead to the security settlement, this is, will be under Iraqi leadership, what they will decide in the next few months. Thank you. Sean. I'll try to be quick. Uh, first, the question on the constitutional amendments and federalism. Uh, it's a topic very close to my heart. When I worked for the UN mission in Iraq for a year of that time, I was working with the Constitutional Revision Committee, so I could go on about federal models for very long period of time, but I think the key point here is the debate in 2005 uh, was so stark as to whether Iraq would move from being a unitary to a federal country that there wasn't time and perhaps the space in those circumstances to have a discussion about what type of federalism was most appropriate for Iraq. And I think that's a discussion that still needs to happen and that can involve both legislation uh, and constitutional amendments. Uh, there are a lot of issues in the Constitution in terms of ambiguities and flat out contradictions, including some issues related to federalism, such as the authorities of ordinary governorates. And uh, clarifying these things, as well as a whole host of other issues not directly related to federalism, I think would be a very useful thing, would be a big uh, important step in Iraq's uh, maturation. It's very important that that does happen by constitutional 
processes so as to uh, increase the respect for the uh, document and the idea of a constitutional democracy. Uh, at the same time, this isn't a technical issue. It, it is very much a political issue. And I think the prospects for it moving forward depend uh, on movement on other political issues uh, at the same time. Uh, moving quickly, the question about uh, people feeling safe to return and how uh, committed the new government is to reconciliation. One of the things that's quite interesting to me, given that the support from the Sadras uh, put Prime Minister Maliki into frontrunner status and support from the Kurdish parties helped to put him over the top, is uh, the range and number of posts which Iraqia was able to get in the government. It looked like at the time, and there was a lot of grumbling from Iraqia, that it would be a third tier partner. But with the Speaker of Parliament, a Deputy Prime Minister position, the Finance Ministry, which is an incredibly powerful mechanism, uh, a say over who will be Minister of Defense, it looks like, and whatever role the National Council for Strategic Policy ends up playing, there's actually been grumbling now from the Sadras, and I saw some remarks by Mahmoud Othman in the newspaper this week, that the two main partners in the government are uh, Iraqia and State of Law. So in terms of the commitment of the government to reconciliation and taking steps uh, on things like uh, integrating the Sons of Iraq and other issues related uh, to reconciliation, a lot of it, I think, will now be uh, you know, something which Iraqia can hopefully drive from within, within inside the government, given the level of seniority and number of posts it has. Uh, finally, on the issue of the Christian community, there's certainly been, uh, in recent months since uh, the, the bombing of the church in Baghdad in November, uh, a heightened tempo of attacks on Christians. I, I think I would be remiss in not saying, or not pointing out, however, that it's really all ethnic and religious minorities in Iraq uh, that have been targeted uh, since 2003. The single worst attack post-2003 was on the Yazidi community in Sinjar, over 400 people killed in a single attack. Uh, the Shebet community in the city of Mosul has almost been entirely wiped out. Uh, it's something actually a priority here for us at USIP. Jason Gluck in our rule of law program is working uh, with the Iraqi parliament to try to build a caucus of the minority members uh, within the parliament so that they can jointly advocate for their rights, whether that's security protection, administrative protection, how the minorities are uh, displayed in sort of educational programs or depicted in educational programs. But it is a very serious issue and one which is actually a focus of our programming. I would just add a few more comments. Um, one is just on federalization. Um, one of the things that's always challenging post-conflict in Iraq is no exception is that perception is reality and federalization for a long time was seen as separation. And that's why you're having new terms like reg regionalization and decentralization, which is why I think the awareness side that Kobat talked about is essential for people to really understand the different techniques. Theo Dolan, who works at the Center of Innovation on Media, is work worked on an incitement project, and one of the top 10 words for incitement in media was federalization. So it clearly is something that kind of strikes a very raw nerve in Iraq, yet is essential for future moving forward. Um, in terms of the question of refugees, the biggest challenge really is internal still. You've got the IDP issue, um, which doesn't just talk about, which isn't just about resettlement. It goes into issues on policies that are essential, like property rights. It goes into issues of protection. Uh, we can say all what we want about Christians staying within Iraq, but if the government, as primary duty bearer, isn't able to protect, then the reality is, is their choice is between death and leaving. And you know whether they stay and they're consistently targeted, whether it's the Christians or other minorities um, or other political parties, then if that right to protect isn't being executed, it's very hard not to provide assistance and support for refugees that are or for Iraqis that are trying to get refugee um, status. I think that that that's one of the biggest challenges is how Iraq will be as primary duty bearer able to provide the services that are needed inside Iraq. We're going to leave the last set of questions for the overflow room who have been patiently um, waiting for their, their turn. Ryan will read the questions that come from the overflow. And then since there seems to be only one question from here, we'll take you as the final question and then closing by the panel. Go ahead. All right, we have several questions from those participating next door. Uh, the first is concerning the Iraqi Christians again. Is there a more serious dimension to the case of Iraqi Christians, i.e. an anti-Western gesture and not a sectarian issue? The second is about the security ministries, and they ask, there, has been a serious, there have been serious allegations of grave evidence underscored by the recent WikiLeaks releases of torture and other human rights abuses by the Iraqi security forces. 
What prospects do you see, especially given the lack of clear leadership at the heads of the security ministries, for addressing part and current abuses, past and current abuses, and ensuring transparency, accountability, and re uh, respect for human rights by Iraqi security forces? The third question comes from Francine Kiefer from the Christian Science Monitor. Uh, so much needs to be done. Should the Iraqi government try to do all these at once, or should uh, should prioritize? If it prioritizes, what should be the top three or four items on the government's to-do list? Mm -hmm. Final question back there. Yes, Raffaele from memory. First of all, a comment. A gentleman before, earlier said that elections and their occupation are illegal. I hope the statement did not stir Konrad Adenauer in his grave because democracy in Germany and in Japan were implemented following elections under occupation. So I mean, let's hope that Iraq will follow the same style. My, my question is, uh, the governor of Baghdad has recently issued order to close night clubs and outlaw the sale of liquor. The same thing happened in Basra. Are we witnessing a trend toward bringing secular Iraq toward some form of uh, Islamic regime styled after Iran. Thank you. Okay. Do we um, want to start with the same order? Sure. Uh, I, I don't see it as a, the, addressing the first question on the attacks on the Christians. I, I don't see it as an attack on the West. Uh, I see it uh, an attack on a very vulnerable community. It's a, unfortunately they're an easy target, um, and and that's uh, I think where Al Qaeda is is being strategic here. Is it, it's targeting um, somebody that really can't fight back. It, it you know it tried to target the Kurds in 2002. The Kurds fought back. It tried to target Western Iraq in 2005 and six, and Western Iraq fought back. Uh, and drove them out. Now they're targeting communities, the Shabaks, Sabis, the, the, the Christians, Yazidis, because they don't, and they can't fight back. So what they need for them, what they need is the state of Iraq of which they're a part of to fight back. And, and I think that that's, in my opinion, uh, the, the, where the heart of the issue um, lies. Uh, on terms of addressing the security ministries and, and, and addressing the allegations of torture and abuse of human rights, which I'm certain are more than just allegations. Um, you know, this is, this is, has to do with the culture of the security services. It's not about changing the minister. You change the minister and everything will be fine. These security services for the last 80 years haven't been the, the, the nicest security <laughs> services. Um, so a culture has been instilled in some of these security services, not, through, not in everybody, but certainly in, in elements of these security services that still exist. There are elements of the former regime that are part of these security services. Uh, and that, I think that's where the, the concern about debaptification and its application or its concept, um, it was initially, I think, genuinely raised, but then I think it was manipulated and, and misused and, and politicized uh, to, to the detriment of, of the country. Um, so it's about addressing a, the culture of violence that, that unfortunately is somewhat pervasive throughout Iraq. Uh, and that can only happen over time. It's not going to happen with changing a minister or two. It's going to happen by, by education, by, by getting people to understand that this is wrong, and, and it's going to take a very long time uh, for that to happen. Um, as far as the government of Iraq's to-do list, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a pretty long to-do list. Um, they have to, you know, we have to address uh, all of the issues, but obviously you, we're not going to be able to address all of the issues. Um, not, not in this term, maybe not in the, the next two or three terms, because the issues are vast, the issues are big, the issues are, are complex. Um, but I, I think, look, governments serve people. Governments protect people. Um, and I think that's the two functions that this government must try to excel at, um, provide services, and protect people, and it can only do that if it has a strong and healthy economy. So those three areas open up a whole host of other topics, but, but getting Iraq's economy right, 
through its oil, but also through other sectors such as agriculture, such as tourism. Uh, yes, tourism, Iraq has enormous tourist potential. Um, gets the money flowing. Once the money's flowing, you can start to really prioritize what services you need to, to deliver. And at the same time, you can ensure that you, know, you, you build people's confidence in the country. You'll start to get security to the country. It's as easy as that. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> there's a good question here to the outer floor, I think, mm -hmm. about the priority for the new government. It's four priority. Number one, the security. Number two, the infrastructure. Number three, the health. Number four, education. Number five, higher education. This is the most important thing, and we not want to forget and increase the good living for the Iraqi people because they are tired from waiting for this. A lot of people, they lost their jobs, they lost their homes. There is a lot of issues, it must take care of it. That's why I hope from the new government will play a big role, especially in security fire. It's the major issue and we have, we hope that the new government will play a big role in these things. Uh, about the human rights, there is a lot of talk here in the question about the human rights. Uh, we have a department for human rights in the new government, and they playing a good role in Iraq and follow up all the cases of the human rights, and we hope to take a rapid action for any negativity about the human rights in Iraq and my party have a, a big a big issue in the human rights policy. They insist on the human rights and we play a big role in follow up and follow up <coughs> a lot of cases. We hear about it and we try to solve it personally. And about the There's a talk about threatening of Islamic regime or something like this, or militia or gangs or a lot of negative things happen in the streets, like my uh, Mr. Talbani, he talked about culture violence. And that's why we want to hurry up in the formation of the new government to close this. Because the new government, all the Iraqi people, their loyalty to the government not to the militia or a special party related to, spe he represent a special field of the government, no. All the people under the law, and the law will be protected by the government. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chabad, I think you had a footnote and then we'll go to Sean. Sure, I, I just wanted to address Nimrud's question regarding the banning of alcohol and nightclubs. I, I forgot to address that. Uh, I think this has been a tussle really since 2003. It's been back and forth. Um, it's actually one of the first questions I ask when I go to Iraq is like, is alcohol illegal or is it legal? Because for me, it gives me a sense, not because I, you know, uh, my only personal interest in the matter, <laughs> <laughs> but because it's, um, it for me sends me, uh, gives me an indication of the pulse of, 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 of the city, of the country. Um, uh, and it constantly ebbs and flows. It constantly, you know, sometimes uh, groups uh, threaten um, and the liquor stores close sometimes try legislation is attempted to be passed and and uh, so there's, there's and this is going to happen there's obviously a very strong islamic influence in the country but i also believe there's a pretty strong secular force in the country um what i probably see happening is there's going to be conservative parts of the country there'll be parts of the country that'll be far more religious and pious than other parts of the country um and uh, you know i don't want to keep harping on about federalism but this could be <laughs> it could be another application of, of federalism where different provinces have different laws. Um, but I, I don't think that, that we'll see an, uh, an Islamic Iraq that, that completely bans and outlaws alcohol and, and other such things. Uh, just quickly trying to go through the questions. As to whether the attacks on the Christians are an anti-Western gesture, uh, I think it's very hard to say that definitively. Just again, taking the example of the Yazidi at one point in 2007, 2008, Al-Qaeda was uh, attempting to institute a blockade around the district of Sinjar to prevent 
uh, supplies from getting in there because they view the Yazidi as devil worshippers. And the Yazidi don't have any particular connection uh, you know, to Western society in the way the Christians are. But having said that, and having sort of spent a fair amount of time traveling around the Nunawit Plains and visiting places like Tokay and Hamdaniya and talking to local Christian leaders, they were certainly conscious of the need to be very careful in what they advocated for, uh, including on issues like autonomy uh, mm -hmm. and sort of what sort of they were practicing in public so as not to give uh, the possibility for propaganda to extremist groups of an effort to establish a Christian state in a Muslim land. So there is an element of it. It doesn't explain all the violence we've seen. Uh, so, you know, I, I wouldn't sort of say definitively it's an anti-Western gesture, but that is, I think, in there somewhere. Uh, in terms of the priority, uh, uh, um, Mr. Talibani mentioned earlier th the formation of a transparent, effective, and accountable revenue sharing mechanism. I would probably add another word to that, national. Uh, if there is an understanding, uh, I think both in law and in the Constitution, that uh, oil, no matter where it is produced in Iraq, is mm -hmm. all goes into one pot and is shared you know, based on an accepted formula like population automatically, uh, that's sort of critical uh, to, I think, a number of political disputes and to Iraqi unity and can decrease some of the political temperature around the debate on issues like federalism. Uh, in terms of other priorities, I mean, people have mentioned security. What I would say is, and what I always hear from Iraqis is the way they judge the government is uh, employment and the delivery of services, particularly electricity. Iraq has the lowest uh, employment to population ratio in the region. Uh, it's sort of critical that people feel like they have a stake in their economic future. And obviously, delivery of services is from day one uh, been something which hasn't been up to par and is something which uh, is the first people look to as a barometer of, of how the government's doing. Uh, in terms of the secular versus in the Islamist Iraq, it's very hard uh, for me to judge as an outsider. I can't, uh, I'm not able to get out and, and to walk uh, around the streets. It was notable to me in the last visit that a number of people were saying uh, that we've always had political differences in Iraq, but we've always uh, been free socially. And they sort of feel like there is uh, now this sort of competition and struggle uh, within the social realm. Uh, on the specific decision to ban alcohol, what a few people mentioned was uh, that this is something which has happened almost every year in the month of Muharram, and then it sort of backslides afterwards. Uh, so to take it perhaps with a little bit of a grain of salt, uh, uh, but I'll probably leave it with that. Good, thank you. Um, just a few things that I would I would add. Um, I when I was in Baghdad right after the church bombings, um, we met with both the prime the prime minister's office as well as some of the MPs. Um, from the Christian community, and the Prime Minister's office was very assertive that these were not anti-Western as much as it was potential ploys to embarrass or undermine the Iraqi government and the government formation. So they felt that that was more of the targeting. Um, and the um, MPs that were representing the Christian community were very clear that it needed to be tackled in a holistic perspective, and they were concerned. They actually issued a very strong statement to the French and German embassies because they were concerned that they were going to further enhance violence against Christians by um, singling them out as uh, immediate refugees. So it's a very fine line um, to balance. On the secular issue, from a, from a civil society perspective, the Iraqi civil society organizations that we work with are very um, concerned and, and constantly testing the waters, similar to as Kabad was saying, both conservative civil society groups as religious because, um, as the more liberal, because of the right of choice. And that's one of the biggest things they're emphasizing. And I wouldn't under estimate the impact of Iraqi civil society. Um, they were successful in both changing the NGO law, uh, which was at one point a very frightening draconian law, and then it swinged over to a very open law to the point where you had security companies uh, registering as NGOs, and they managed to put it right <laughs> in the middle. And um, that was thanks to civil society. We remember those days well. Uh, but that was thanks to civil society that was part of the drafting and really influenced the um, committee on parliament that introduced the law. Of course, there's still the question in the future of how it will be implemented. But the actual law was something that the civil society should be proud of. And then the very recent lawsuit against the government because of the delay of formation. That was, I wouldn't say one of the reasons, but it was definitely a nudge that came from Iraqi civil society saying we're watching. And I think that that's going to be where the balance on the social level really comes, is the influence that civil society has in terms of holding government accountable. And we're seeing more and more of that. 
Um, before I close, I also wanted to remind, because unfortunately we, we lost Dr. Ali Dabar before the end, but you know his point about Iraq and its neighbors, I think that that is a very crucial point and something that we should keep in mind, particularly with the Arab summit. You know, Watching that closely, if it takes place, we know for those of us who travel to Baghdad, the influence it's having inside and the changes that are happening um, inside in terms of being able to accommodate, and I think that will be a significant turning point for Iraq in terms of building its relationships with its neighbors, Arab Arab and beyond. Um, so thank you very much to our esteemed panelists. Thank you to all of us, for, for to all of you for um, staying for so long. And um, hopefully we will continue our discussions on Iraq this year. Thank you. Thank you.